am delighted to be here today as the publisher of Mark's wonderful biography of Philip Schuller. Schuller deserves to be marked and remembered, um, not as a two-dimensional and, and semi-fictional character in a pay television series, but as a complex and fascinating man whose short life combined an extraordinary mix of charm, passion, journalistic integrity and courage. He was truly one of the best and the brightest, and I believe that Mark's book has, has done him proud. I'm equally delighted to welcome Les today, and I don't think that there could be a more fitting person in Australia to launch this book. First, in a personal sense, because it was Les who actually introduced me to Mark. And secondly, because Les's two extraordinary books on Australia's role and involvement in the First War have become classics, and the benchmarks by which all First War histories are now judged. I feel huge pride in having been involved in publishing both Les and Mark. So without further ado, I give you Les Carlion. I've known Tom for close to 20 years, and one of his many virtues as a publisher is that he knows how to produce a striking cover. And I think, I think he's trumped himself here with this, this moody, sepia jacket. It, it not only captures the tone of the book, but also the lost world Mark is writing about. And it's right enough, too, that uh, Tom is here at the Melbourne Press Club today. I, I'd suggest to Mark Baker, actually, that Tom uh, almost qualifies as a sponsor. He's published three books by John Hamilton, two by Cam Forbes, one by Charlie Happel, three of mine, and one by my son, Patrick. They're the ones that come to mind. There's doubtless others. And furthermore, Tom's employed a number of Melbourne journalists as ghostwriters for sporting celebrities. You know, the people who, who need to tell their life stories but have trouble with the eight-word sentence, particularly if it involves commas. <laughs> so... In an era when print journalists everywhere are falling off cliffs, Tom deserves to be acknowledged as a true benefactor of the craft and a good man to know, particularly if you work for that interesting print organisation that keeps explaining to me that the trick to quality journalism is to employ fewer and fewer journalists. Johnny Sylvester and Mick Gordon are laughing. It's a pleasure to be asked to launch this book today for two reasons. First, Philip Schuller of the Age is one of my journalistic heroes. And second, Mark Baker is also a journalist I've long admired. Right back to the days when he was a teenage cadet with unusually good manners and a shy smile that said he knew what you were really thinking, but he wouldn't tell anyone. Now to Philip Schuller. It's, it's odd how mythology works, how it remembers some people and walks straight past others. For instance, in the context of this book, we might ask ourselves why Churchill is remembered as the villain of the Gallipoli disaster and Herbert Asquith is not. Asquith was the British Prime Minister. He let it all happen. He looked away when he should have looked on. But mythology, fickle creature that it is, absolves him of all blame. Then there's Ataturk or, or Colonel Mustafa Kemal, as he was at the time of Gallipoli. He's famous, and rightly, for his decisiveness on that first morning at Gallipoli. Hardly anyone has ever heard of Sefik Bey, another Turkish colonel, yet Sefik Bey brought his troops into action two hours before Ataturk and stopped the Anzacs just past Lone Pine. And then there are the, the Gallipoli eyewitnesses. Charles Bean has been canonised, and again rightly, as the chronicler of Gallipoli and the Western Front, as well as an Australian of great bravery and decency Yet Philip Schuller 
a natural writer in ways Bean was not, has been pretty much forgotten, until Mark came along anyway. And there is, as we know, there's no logic to these things. But Shuler's case is particularly odd because while most Australians may not recognise his name, most have seen his photography. He took those Goya-like photos from the grottoes of Lone Pine. Blackened hands hanging over the parapet, men with faces drained to a pale marble, men with swelling white eyes that seem to be staring at something a thousand yards away. Those photographs, 2,000 of them, are the best known images in the Australian War Memorial's huge photographic collection. They're also the most requested. Yet Philip wasn't a trained photographer. He taught himself. He was a trained journalist and a good one. In other words, he was one of us, except that he was better than most of us. <coughs> no one wrote finer prose from Gallipoli than Philip. No one there had an eye and an ear to match his. And Philip's story, and specifically his persona, is a nice change, I think, from the Gallipoli cliché in books and films the one that so often celebrates Stan and Murr, two big-hearted shearers from Wagga Wagga, who wear their lack of sophistication as badges of honour. Philip loved books, plays, dancing, the opera and the arts in general. He liked women and they liked him. Everyone seemed to like him. He was that, that rare thing the shining youth, the bright young life. He was 25 years old, handsome and intelligent, and he could have been anything. Then he went to Gallipoli, where he found his writer's voice. He wrote several pieces exposing the callous treatment of the Anzac wounded, and these resulted in Australia changing its medical arrangements. When he returned, he wrote Australia in Arms. It's got a nice finish on it, this book, particularly when one remembers the author was only 26. Philip had already learned enough to shun the earnest and the windy. He led the reader in gently by opening the book with two humorous anecdotes. His account of the charge at the neck with its strong verb, still stands as a wonderful, evocative piece of eyewitness reporting. He sees a thin, waning moon. He sees tongues of flame. I became fascinated with Philip when I was writing my two books on World War I. And my wife, Denise, who helped me so much with the fact-gathering, became equally enthralled. Part of the appeal to us was, was obviously Philip's attractive personality, but a, another part concerned the mysteries that swirled around him. He was said to have been engaged to a beautiful widow in Cairo, and so the story went. The lady arranged for a plaque to be installed in an Anglican church there to honour him after his death. Denise even wrote to the Anglicans in Cairo to see if she could find out more, but there was no reply. I guess it wasn't a good time to own up to being an Anglican in Cairo. Still isn't. Another of the mysteries, why in 1916 did Philip go back to the war? And not as an officer, as he could have, not as a war correspondent, as he probably could have, but as a driver, the equivalent of a private. What was he trying to do? We never found the answers. Mark Baker has found them, and I won't spoil things by alluding to them, except to say 
that Mark has gone far beyond writing another war book. Part of the charm of this book is that it's a love story, a very unusual and affecting one. And another charm is the, the Shakespearean cast of characters Mark has assembled. There's Ian Hamilton, the army commander at Gallipoli, courteous and courtly, a decent man, a man of integrity and moral courage, and sadly, a lousy general. There's Philip's father, Frederick, who edited The Age for 26 years. Frederick would correct his last proof shortly before midnight and catch the last tram home along Bridge Road just before the presses started to hum. And in, in passing, that tells you something about ideas of progress in our new cyber age. In 1910, the age landing on the lawn was carrying more late news than it does today. And the zealous Ashmead Bartlett, the flamboyant Fleet Street reporter, who not only started the Anzac mythology in Australia, but also bulked up expense accounts so that they became fantastic works of fiction. It is said he set the benchmarks for Peter Smark <laughs> and Peter McFarlane. Mark's research has been extraordinary. But research alone, research alone doesn't make a good book. Good books are about good writing and here Mark has excelled himself. The prose is cool and clear throughout so it seems the most natural thing to turn the page and then the next one. Mark belongs to an era when print journalism produced great generalists. He's been a foreign correspondent and a war reporter. He even managed to get himself shot once, but he still filed the story hours later. He's, added, he's edited a capital city daily with great distinction, and he's won a Walkley Award for headline writing. In other words, he, he's done it all. But this, this book, is, I think, the best thing he's done. As I said, it's an honour to be asked to launch such a fine book. And I should remind you that Mark will be available for signings in 15 minutes or so, mainly because he needs the money. <laughs> today, today, Philip Schuler is no longer forgotten and we're all the richer. Congratulations, Mark. It's time to hear from you. The book, the book is now launched. Thank you. Les Carline has always been an impossibly hard act to follow <clears throat> in every respect. Um, and in the case of this book, um, it wouldn't have happened without Les's support, his encouragement, and his, his invaluable advice and the support of Denise Carline. Uh, you both knew what a rich narrative there was to be unearthed long before I had a clue. I'm delighted and honoured that you're both here today, along with your son Patrick, another thoroughbred writer from the Carline stables. Um, I've been a journalist for more than 40 years. I've had the great fortune to have lived and worked through some of the golden era of newspapers. Um, but in all that time, including 13 years working as a foreign correspondent, nothing has matched the pleasure of researching and writing about the brief but extraordinary life of Philip Frederick Edward Schuller. One of the greatest pleasures of this journey, beyond having a 90,000 word count and years to file the copy, mostly without pesky editors breathing down my neck, has been, a thrill, has been the thrill of discovery, gradually bridging many of the gaps that existed in the known record of Schuller's life, his career and his relationships. Uh, in that process, um, I've been assisted by a series of wonderful people. Some I stumbled upon, some who found me. I'm pleased that many of them are here today. Sue Strafford, Richard Howard, 
Dan Nemec, Maria Denham, Andy Ryan and Mick Dexter, to name a few. My heartfelt thanks to all of you uh, and the many others who have generously helped me along the way. I first got involved in the story of Philip Schuler more than a decade ago. I was aware that there'd been an aged journalist uh, who covered the Gallipoli campaign uh, and who, who later was killed on the Western Front in 1917. That was about it. In 2005, the paper was casting around for a story to focus its annual Anzac Day coverage on. Um, I'd, um, I'd just come back from posting in Singapore. I volunteered to knock something uh, together about this character, Philip Schuler. It was a revelation. This pampered 24-year-old editor's son, barely four years' experience in journalism before he was sent to cover a world war in Europe, had it all. He, he, um, he was an original triple threat, as Maria Denham would like to put it, a fine writer, a fearless correspondent, and a keen-eyed photographer. Among the dispatches that I dug out uh, was his account of the Battle of the Neck, which uh, Les alluded to a little earlier. It moved me then, and it still does. In fact, I think it's one of the great pieces of war reporting, anytime, anywhere. From the forward trenches, Schuler observed the mindless slaughter of the Australian Light Horse regiments, that who were ordered to charge, just with fixed bayonets, into the bar barrage of Turkish machine gun fire. Schuler was the first to tell the story of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander White of the 8th Light Horse Regiment, which, uh, which formed the first wave of the attack. Here's a taste of what he wrote. White elected to lead the men he loved. He made a brief farewell to his brother officers. He shook them by the hand and went into the firing line. He stood waiting with his watch in his hand. Men, he said, you have 10 minutes to live. And those light horsemen of the regiment, recruited from the heart of Victoria, knew what he said was true. White was killed moments after he charged. His body never recovered. <clears throat> that Anzac Day special in the age ran as a four-page wraparound. Looked very impressive. But that, I thought, was the end of my writing about Philip Schuler. A few weeks later, I took a phone call at the office. The caller said his name was Richard Howard. And he said how much he had, joined the, he had enjoyed the article, Schuler's War. I thanked him for the feedback and was about to hang up when he said, yeah, I think he's my grandfather. When I replied politely that as far as I knew, Schuler had never married or had children, Richard began my re-education and my incurable fascination with the life of Philip Schuler. A few days later, I was sitting at Richard and Lynn's table, dining table in Warrandyte, and hearing the remarkable story of Polly and Max Howard. After returning from Gallipoli and writing the first Australian book, which Les mentioned, Australia in Arms, Schuler decided to enlist as an ordinary soldier. He was drawn to share the sacrifice of the soldiers he had chronicled over the previous two years. He did not seek an officer's commission and settled for a, the humblest of jobs, a driver with the service corps attached to John Monash's new, newly formed 3rd Division. Before he embarked for France, Schuler spent a weekend at the homestead high in the forests behind Yarra Junction. Among the other guests was Polly Howard, a dark-haired, dark-eyed beauty, a long-time friend of the Schuler family, and a mother of three. Polly and Philip had been good friends for many years. That weekend, they became much more. Max Howard was born in October 1916. Max would live his entire life unaware that his real father was Philip Schuler. And Schuler never met, and indeed may never have known about, his son. Polly brought up Max as the youngest of her children with husband Charles Howard even though the late arrival grew up to tower over his siblings and be different in many, many ways. It was not until the end of, near the end of her life that Polly confessed to a close relative that Max was Schuler's son, a fact that was also kept secret from Max, who died in 1995. 
The truth was revealed to Richard Howard by his mother Meg some years later. And it was not until Richard read my Anzac article in The Age in 2005 that he realised that Philip Schuller was not merely a soldier of German extraction who had served in the first AIF, but a distinguished war correspondent. I am honoured uh, to have played a part in that life-changing discovery and to have helped connect Richard with other relatives of Philip Schuller, including his great niece, Sue Strafford. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Richard Howard. Um, something else to note, um, Richard's, on Richard's table is, is a one-year-old, Arlo, who, if I'm not mistaken, is the great-great-grandchild of Philip Schuller. Arlo. <laughs> Another of the great mysteries of the Schuller story was also around affairs of the heart. Before he embarked for France, uh, Schuller prepared a will. In it, he bequeathed the royalties from his book to his friend, Madame Rabinovich of Helwan, Egypt. His family knew he had been engaged to marry a beautiful woman in Cairo, a widow with two young daughters, but they had no idea who Madame Rabinovich was. It was a mystery that had also eluded the research efforts of Denise and Sue Strafford. As I prepared to begin writing this book, I was determined to solve that puzzle. One weekend early in 2004, I spent several hours scouring the internet for clues. I have no idea of the cyber pathways that led me there, but I eventually stumbled on the name of a woman called Nellie Rossi. She was married to a German, German, uh, sorry, a Russian doc, Russian-born doctor named Alexis Rabinovich, who died in early 1915, and she had two young daughters, Sasha and Chicky. Various Jewish genealogical sites then led me to the name of Sasha's son, Gabriel Jasopovici. When I googled Gabriel's, Gabriel's name, the internet lit up like a Christmas tree. Gabriel Jasopovici is a retired professor of English at the University of Sussex, an accomplished novelist, playwright and literary critic with a publications list as long as my arm. An email sent via his publisher drew a response from Gabriel that made my day and my book. How fascinating, a letter I never thought to receive, Gabriel wrote. I had no idea Philip Schuller was a famous Australian journalist and of course I am delighted to hear it. All the information I had came from my mother and aunt, Nellie's two daughters. Um, I wish Gabriel could be here today. My book would not have been half as rich as it is without the immense contribution of his family research, the moving poems of his mother, and the stunning photographs of Nellie, Alexis, and their girls. Nellie Rabinovich came from one of the richest and most influential families in Egypt in the early 20th century, and she fell deeply in love with Philip Schuller. They planned to marry after the war. His death was a shattering blow to her, so much so that it drove her to convert to his faith and to have her girls baptised to the consternation of her Jewish parents. While visiting Gabriel in London two years ago, he produced an old letter from the son of Netta, the lady's maid who was close to Nellie's girls throughout their childhood and was present throughout the courtship of Philip Schuller. The astonishing news was that Dan Nemec was living in Brunswick. After World War II, his then widowed mother had decided to migrate to Australia with her three children, inspired by Philip Schuller's tales in 1915 about his exotic homeland. Dan Nemec was another great friend of this book. I am also delighted that he's here today with his brother Rehard and his daughter Belinda. <clears throat> um, there was one more eureka moment in my research. On the centenary of the first AIF convoy embarking from Melbourne, Ted Bailey kindly invited me to come along and say a few words about journalists in that convoy, uh, which I was pleased to do. And I went to uh, the ceremony down at Station Pier. As I was preparing to speak, I looked out into the audience and a couple of rows 
back, I noticed uh, a white-haired lady with a remarkable str string of uh, miniature metal ribbons on her lapel, or middle, miniature medals on her lapel. I could recognise from where I was sitting the Distinguished Service Order, the Military Cross, uh, and the Distinguished Conduct Medal, service medals for the Boer War and for the First World War. I made a note, I must go and ask that lady who her very brave relative is. When I finished my piece and the others who'd spoken, I, I, I looked up to find standing in front of me Lady Geraldine Curry. I need to speak to you about your Mr Shula, she said. Oh, I'd love to. She then uh, took me through across the room to meet her brother Mick, Mick Dexter, who is here today. That chance meeting with the son and daughter of Padre Walter Dexter provided me a rich source of material. Uh, Walter Dexter deserves a, a book in his own right, an incredible character who finished the war as the most senior Anglican chaplain on the Western Front. Uh, he would fought bravely in the Boer War, where he won his DCM and was decorated Gallipoli and on the Western Front. Um, Dexter and Shuler became good friends on the voyage to out of Australia. They were close, spent a lot of time together in Egypt. When Shuler finally got ashore at Gallipoli in July 1915, Walter Dexter was the first to take him around the front line trenches. Uh, my thanks to, to Mick for his assistance and the family for allowing me access to his wonderful diaries which now reside in the Australian War Memorial. Now, some, perhaps many of you, might be thinking, well, this is all very interesting, but why should we be bothered with the story of a young Australian journalist who died almost 100 years ago, however fine his writing, however exotic his love life, however poignant the circumstances of his death? I say, lots of reasons. At one stage, I wanted to title this, the title of this book to be Philip Schuler, The Lost Voice of Anzac. I was quickly overruled. Those who know better advise that there was serious Anzac fatigue in the book trade. Two years into the centenary of Anzac, we are indeed awash with military history titles. Fair enough. My compromise was to name this lunch, The Lost Voice of Anzac. <laughs> and I am delighted that this didn't preclude a full house today. At the heart of the book is the political battle that was fought just as tenaciously as the military contest over the future of the Gallipoli campaign. The argument about whether to evacuate or to, to stay and fight after the disastrous offensive of August 1915 was fiercely contested before Britain's embattled Asquith government decided to quit. The popular perception in Australia is that Gallipoli was a disaster from the outset and that the lives of brave Australian soldiers were squandered in a hopeless cause by callous and incompetent British generals. That was the thesis embraced by Keith Murdoch, who, after a brief stop over at Gallipoli, on his way to a desk job in London, wrote an explosive letter to Prime Minister Andrew Fisher that fuelled the Quit Gallipoli campaign. Another common assumption is that all journalists covering the campaign railed against oppressive censorship, had no respect for the generals, and formed a cheer squad behind Keith Murdoch and British correspondent Ellis Ashmead Bartlett in their political campaign to have General Sir Ian Hamilton sacked and the Dardanelles expedition aborted. In fact, Philip Schuler had immense respect for Hamilton, with whom he built a close relationship. He was not opposed to or unduly constrained by censorship, and he believed that evacuation was a terrible mistake. He was convinced that had the British government held its nerve and sent the necessary reinforcement, reinforcements and munitions, the Allies would have broken through in early 1916, captured Constantinople and helped shorten the war. Schuller had been a close friend of Keith Murdoch. They, shared to, they started together as cadets at the age, shared close mutual friendships and for a while lived together. But Schuller was furious with Murdoch's intriguing at Gallipoli and their relationship never recovered. One of the great what-ifs of the Schuller story is what impact might he have had on Australia's perceptions of Gallipoli had he lived to argue his corner, as Murdoch, Charles Bean and the others did. 
Instead, the great tragedy was that he died of wounds a few days after fighting gallantly at the Battle of Messines, just shy of his 28th birthday. I believe Philip Schuller needs to be better known and celebrated as one of the important lost voices of the First World War. I hope my book will serve that end. The great tragedy of the abandonment of the Gallipoli campaign is that the Australian troops were not rescued from danger. The outcome Keith Murdoch was convinced would be the dividend of his agitation. Instead, they were dispatched to a far more perilous killing field on the Western Front. And because their gallant reputations preceded them, they were earmarked for some of the toughest and deadliest fighting in France and Del Belgium. Today, as we know, is the 100th anniversary of the ending of the Battle of Fromel. In just 24 hours, there were 5,533 casualties from the Australian 5th Division, almost 2,000 of them killed. In one day, almost a quarter of the total Australian death toll from eight months fighting at Gallipoli, lest we forget. Thank you for coming. I hope you will enjoy this book as much as I've enjoyed writing it. Well, thanks very much, Mark, for allowing me to stand up here on this very special occasion. Um, you um, have given me and my family uh, an enormous gift. When uh, my father and auntie died within a month of each other in 1995, my aunt at the age of 93 and my father at the age of 79, I inherited two things. One was a Chinese vase which 10 years later we discovered was worth well over $300,000. And the other thing which I inherited was really no more than the fragment of a story and a name. And that name was Philip Schuler. Well, it took us 10 years to look more closely into that mystery. And in fact, it was briefly, shortly after reading Mark's article in 2005, that my son Vaughan, who's <coughs> here today, said, Dad, I'm going to find out who Philip Schuler was. And he looked up on the internet, and lo and behold, in there before us, we actually hadn't yet seen Mark's article. We missed it in the age. Um, but we found the article that Mark had written. And that was the beginning of, of well, it was a huge fulfilment and, and a revelation, but beginning of another journey. Um, uh, the, the unfolding of another story. I can't help thinking that there's something rather Homeric about this epic. The first 10 years between my father dying and me hearing the name Philip Schuller, corresponding to the Iliad, and then perhaps the next 10 years between that point of time and now, the, pub, the, the publication of Mark's book being the uh, Odyssey. Rather appropriate images considering the location of those stories, I think. Um, it has been a life-transforming experience for me, um, it, beset by doubt at, at times, but gradually more and more pieces fitting together, both physical evidence but emotional and psychological evidence, and even hints, I think, from what I would call a sort of spiritual world, that, that there was a reality, there was a truth behind all of this. And it was important that this story be told. And I, I wish to read this poem today because it captures a certain moment which is really a turning point for me in understanding my own relationship and the relationship of my family to Philip Schuller, which was, um, took place last year when, when my wife and I travelled north from Paris to Steenweg to, to visit Philip's grave. And um, when we fir fa fa finally found our way there, we noted that someone else had been there recently and in fact planted a plant at the base of the headstone. And um, when we got back to Paris, um, that very night and we received an email from Mark telling us that he had been to Steenwerk two weeks earlier and he had planted that very plant. So it's extraordinary how quickly in, uh, answers come back to you sometimes. Another little answer of a, of a kind came to me only on Monday night when I started to read Philip's book, uh, Mark's book. Uh, 
Um, and that was that um, I, I read the date on which Philip had been, was born. I, I, the 9th of July, of course, 1889. It was only then that I realised that my own grandson, who is just turned one, was also born on the 9th of July last year, which happened also to be the date on which my mother died the year previously to that. So um, I'm not reading too much into this except it, brought, it led me to think thoughts about renewal. I don't think I have to suggest um, any particularly tangible or melodramatic sense of, of spiritual presence or return, but in some sense which is universal and not personal, I do feel that, that Philip Schuller has not just been remembered in this book and in this occasion, but he has, in a very real sense, returned. He's returned into not just my life and the life of my family, but I think into the whole consciousness of people um, living um, in this state, in, in, in the whole of Australia, and perhaps also in the whole of the world. In fact, he does seem to be a, a, a character, an individual who whose being extends around the world. And, and uh, I won't say too much more. I, my teacher, who taught me so much about um, writing poetry and speaking, always said, don't explain your poems. But I, I was always good at ignoring advice. But I wrote this poem briefly, uh, immediately after returning from Steenweg, um, the night that we visited his grave. Um, and it's simply called Trois Arbres Cemetery, Steenweg, um, dedicated to Philip Schuller. We both sense you here, sweetly present in the dappled light beneath the trees, quiet and unassuming, at one with all the simple beauty of your surroundings. The spring flowers, the budding trees, the first hay harvest underway, the kind-hearted country folk who live nearby and tend your grave. Neither you nor we are overly surprised by this encounter. It seems that all the time and distance that have separated us, the unnecessary anguish and uncertainty of our relationship cease to exist or have never existed and we can be happily together for half an hour or half an eternity. I don't know which. I bear you greetings from friends on the other side. I bear you greetings from friends on the other side of the world. and the love of a son who never knew you. In return, you give assurance that life is never lost forever. No matter how great the sadness and the horror of our going, there is always peace and joy in the moment of return. Thank you. Hi, my name's Carolyn Holbrook from Monash University. I was wondering what you two thought about the television shows that were on last year for the centenary. I watched two of them, the, the miniseries Gallipoli, which famously didn't rate very well, but I thought it was a really good, interesting show. And the other one that was even less well-known called Deadline Gallipoli, starring Sam Worthington playing, I think, Philip Schuller. And I thought that was even better. I thought that was a a really, really good show and a new perspective on Gallipoli. So I wonder what you guys thought of those two, if you saw them. Um, well, I didn't see the first. Uh, I saw the second. And I bang on endlessly about the second in my book. Uh, I thought it was a fabulous piece of entertainment, but it should have had it in giant letters across the front from the outset, complete fiction. Um, I thought their portrayal of Philip Schuller in particular was 
disgraceful. It completely misrepresented his personality, his, his, uh, his views. Uh, it conscripted him as a member of, uh, 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 well, essentially um, Ellis Ashmead Bartlett's campaign to spear Hamilton, uh, when in reality Philip Shuler was very close to Hamilton, had immense respect for him throughout, and they, in, in fact, were very close. So it was, it was a bit ridiculous. And I thought it was a disappointment from my point of view because it was an opportunity to do something special. They spent a lot of dough. It could have been brilliant. Uh, Caroline, I, uh, I shouldn't say anything about the first one because I advised them on factual matters. I had nothing to do with the writing of it. Uh, so I'll stay out of that. Uh, deadline Gallipoli, I'm exactly where Mark is. Uh, it just astounded me that uh, people could get it so wrong. Uh, the thing that astounded me most, actually, was in one passage, Charles Bean says the magic word. And Charles Bean would never have said the magic word in his life. He would never have said, damn. Um, they got him wrong. Uh, Mark said they got, they got Philip badly wrong and the whole idea of it that, you know, all these journalists were being pushed around by naughty censors and everything else, that wasn't the case at all. Um, the whole problem was Ashmead Bartlett reckoned the, the landing should have been another place. Uh, but, the, it, you know, it, it was compared, I think somebody it didn't they to the, all the president's men and it's nothing like that yeah. I, I'll tell you the show I did enjoy uh, and it's pure fiction but I I enjoyed it for its originality and that was the water diviner uh, the Russell Crowe one yes. which it was just a straight made up story but it brought the Turkish side in very well and I thought it was good sorry mate yeah, that's fine why is it that you, as a similarly aged, middle-aged bloke, grew up in the 60s, learn a bit, why are you now accepting what seems to be, oh, let's remember the diggers in World War I, why? Because they were heroes. They were weren't, they were poor bloody no, no, fools. If I can just... Why are you doing it? I, I think I, I got the question... I think I got the question if I could chime Thank in you. there. Uh, that's not what I'm doing at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling the story of someone who did what he did, who was exemplary in what he did, uh, and whose view was at odds with what is a widespread perception still in Australia of what the reality was or what the truth was, however. So it's a different point of view. That's what I've always liked in my career in journalism. Tell me something I haven't heard before. Tell me something different. That's what it's about. And I think if you get into this excellent book, and I'll happy to sell you a copy in a moment, um, <laughs> when you read it, I think you'll be convinced how good it is. Uh, look, very quickly, the, uh, the reason we write about war is because it's a great part of history. It matters. We're not saying it's good. It's bad. But it happened. And the significance of the First World War is it, it set the pattern for the whole century, the whole 20th century. First World War led to the Russian Revolution. First World War led to all these new countries in Eastern Europe. First World War led to Hitler. Hitler started the Second World War on a lie, because they hadn't really lost the First World War. The end of the Second World War led to the Cold War, and on it goes. Countries like Iraq uh, came out of the First World War. In a sense, Israel did. It's part of history. So we're not writing about it because it's good or anything. We're writing about it to understand it, and maybe we won't repeat it. Um, as a military strategy, was Gallipoli a good idea? Uh, that's above my pay scale. <laughs> uh, Johnny... I think it was a very badly thought out idea. Uh, what I was alluding to when I was speaking about Asquith was 
there was a subcommittee of cabinet looking after Gallipoli. It met on the 13th of March before the naval attack that failed. It didn't meet again until May, mid-May. In between that time, the land war had begun. In other words, it just sort of happened. Um, it was never properly thought through. The, the numbers were wrong. If you, if you line it up with Normandy, they, they planned Normandy, the landings, for two years. Right down to hell, we get a harbour in there, you know, the Mulberry Harbours and the concrete. They put a pipeline under the uh, North Sea to send diesel oil over. Everything was planned carefully. What, what it essentially amounted to was uh, there was a period there where when the trench stable mate, uh, stable mate, stale mate <laughs> came in, it's my background, uh, <laughs> when, the, when the trench stale mate came, there, were all, there was this mad grasping for ideas. You know, maybe we'll go the back way. But they never had the numbers. Um, they landed five divisions, the Allies, at Gallipoli. There were six Turkish divisions there. If you're going to stage an amphibious landing, you want about three or four times the number on the shore. It was not a good idea. It, it, I, I got a feeling it was George Bush in another incarnation. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah OK. Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, congratulations, Mark, on the book. It's, it's terrific. It's very enjoyed. And Les, it's wonderful to have you here launching it as well. Um, just on that uh, comment you've made about Gallipoli, one of the uh, important things happened in February that year, which led, contributed to the Gallipoli disaster from my reading of the history, and that was in February, uh, Winston Churchill, as the first Lord of the Admiralty, decided to take uh, a quick move through, uh, into, uh, through the Straits and to try and go through into and capture Constantinople. It was done purely with the Navy. They felt that, uh, this is in February, they felt that they could go through there and they would get through to Constantinople. Churchill made the fam famous comment when asked about it at the time that he said, I will be smoking a cigar in Constantinople tonight. They went through the Straits. They hadn't picked that there was huge uh, Turkish defence on the, on, the, on the hills. Uh, the mine sweeping wasn't done correctly. The British fleet in particular that went in there suffered terrible disaster, Half, most of them were sunk, turned around and then went back to the UK. Um, the Times, uh, and my understanding is that Winston Churchill had a good contact at the Times, on the, on the day that the Navy went, tried to get through, the Times was running the story saying, this is what's happening, we are going through, what a wonderful thing and we'll be in Constantinople. That was written on the morning of the 15th of March. There had not been a war cabinet decision on it, but Churchill had said, let's go. That was a terrible failure, uh, because also there was no question about troop follow-up and what might happen later. Just a few short weeks, two or three months, a few months later, the, the, the switch was made to Gallipoli, so plan A was a disaster, plan B was all right, let's go to Gallipoli and we'll send the troops in there and we'll have those wonderful Anzac troops who'll, who'll, who'll do the job. Um, would you like to comment on that? Uh, look, that, that's uh, pretty much how it developed, just bit by bit, uh, pushed mainly by Churchill. But he had a Prime Minister and the Prime Minister at a certain stage sort of said to him, how are we going to do this? What are you planning? Whatever. Uh, if I could just add a further point, one, one of the faults in this plan, it, it's funny, they say when you write history the first thing you must do is go to the documents, and you must, you, you've got to look at them. What the documents don't say in this case though is that there was a mentality in Britain that the Turks were a pushover. And I think Kitchener actually used the phrase, they'll run away. Why would they run away? I mean, Turkey's got a martial history goes way, way back to the 1300s. Some of those soldiers at Gallipoli had fought in the two Balkan Wars of 1911 and 1913. 
they weren't going to run away, but I think that was part of the mentality. I, I thought too when you, you mentioned February, the other event in February which gets forgotten in February 3, the Turks attach, attacked the uh, Suez Canal from the Sinai. And there's lately been a lot of people saying this is terrible, this invasion of Turkey by Australia, they never did anything to us. Well, they were going to knock off our trade route to Britain apart from anything else. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, we always have a group from Kilvington Grammar and I notice there's a very strapping young man from Melbourne Grammar, Emre Baker, I believe. <laughs> He's happy to hand you the microphone. <laughs> Hi, Mr Baker. Lauren from Kilvington. Um, now, you've commented on how Shula had a very different perspective than um, in comparison to other war correspondents of the time. With everything that's going on in the world at the moment, the war on terror, are there any great war correspondents that you would compare Philip Shuler to today? Well, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think what I would say about that just is that, uh, that, I mean, being a war correspondent has always been a risky business and a lot of people have died doing it, a lot of people have been hurt doing it. Uh, I think being a war correspondent today is pretty much suicidal, really. Um, and what we see in these dreadful conflicts uh, uh, and the unfolding conflicts in Syria, Iraq and so forth is that it's just too dangerous because uh, once upon a time journalists used to range around more or less with impunity. They were recognised as non-combatants. They, they had a status. The, there, was, there was a respect, you know, by and large on both sides in, in traditional old style conflicts of that. But nowadays a journalist is a target if not to be killed, then to be captured and ransomed and whatever. So what we're seeing is, uh, in Western terms, the, the days of that we saw them in the past of, of the individual correspondents going out and getting in the thick of it in the field is, has become just too hard. And, and more and more what we're seeing, particularly with TV networks, is uh, they are conscripting uh, local fixers and agents to sort of do that work because, uh, well, it's less, less dangerous for Westerners, but... Uh, those people at least have a bit more nous about the front lines and the areas to, to move, uh, move around. So yes, it's changed. The world has changed, unfortunately. 